afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for on day two of the Water Justice Confluence. Um, my name is Amanda Cabanillas, and I've been working alongside Riverkeeper and the Sanctuary, uh, Sanctuary for Independent Media to coordinate this event. Um, for those of you who were not able to be with us last night and who may not be familiar with the Media Sanctuary, um, I just want to provide you with a little bit of a background story. Um, so the Media Sanctuary is a nonprofit community organization based in North Central Troy, New York, just across the Hudson River from Albany. They operate a block-wide campus of activities where the Sanctuary for Independent Media is their headquarters uh, that doubles as a telecommunications facility and performance venue where they host speakers, independent film screenings, and live music. It's also home to two recording studios for their community radio, uh, radio station WOOC 105.3 FM. They host a volunteer driven nightly news and public affairs show called Hudson Mohawk Magazine and also run a variety of youth programs, operate collared city growers, their urban gardens and bring all of their activities out into Freedom Square, the outdoors performance venue. Another program at Media Sanctuary is the Nature Lab, which stands for North Troy Art, Technology, and Urban Research in Ecology. This upcoming spring, they will be opening the doors to their newest building on the block, the Nature Lab Urban Environmental Education Center. Um, this new space will seek to empower the public with grassroots science and include programs such as the People's Health Sanctuary, focused on health empowerment and equity, a DIY community biology lab where they will teach science literacy and science skills, and their water justice lab in collaboration with Riverkeeper, which I will provide some more information about later in our program. The first year of the Water Justice Lab culminates with this virtual event of advocates from the Hudson River watershed communities and representatives of youth groups who, along with their mentors, will be leading discussions of environmental activism and justice, as well as possible future actions we can partake in. Last night, we kicked things off with a screening of the youth filmed and produced Echoes from Lock One. That was followed by a conversation with some of the youth, mentors, and film crew. At the end of the evening, we opened up the space to JOC and Shutezkat, our guest hip hop artists and indigenous environmental activists. Today, we are taking a deeper dive by hearing from our environmental mentors and youth groups. They are Genesis Cooper, Gabby Espada, and Shansonique Pollock of the Water Justice Lab, Jessica Alonso, Brianna Gray, and Isaiah Pacheco of the Kingston YMCA Farm Project, and Diana Akokal and Emperatri Soheda of Groundwork Hudson Valley's Green Team. Our environmental mentors are Sachem Hawkstorm, hereditary chief of the Scotticoke people, and Heather Briegel of the Stockbridge Muncie community. We'll then join them all in breakout groups where we will brainstorm concrete actions that will guide how we carry the fight for environmental justice into our own communities. With all of that said, we ask that everybody remain muted when not in the breakout groups. And we encourage you all to participate in the larger conversation by dropping your questions into the chat. Our conversation moderators will ask you to unmute individually if needed. Now I'd like to begin today's program by introducing our first speaker, Sachem Hawkstorm. Sachem Hawkstorm is the hereditary Sachem or chief of the Scotticoke people. He's a fierce advocate for the rights of his people as well as other indigenous peoples in the New York region. His work focuses on cultural heritage, education, and tribal sovereignty. H.M. Hawkstorm has participated in the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 
focusing on economic and social development, cultural preserva preservation, water and food sovereignty, self-determination, human rights, and environmental justice. He has worked in close partnership with the United Confederation of Taino People, Ramapo Lenape Tribal Nation of New Jersey, and Golden Hill Pagaset Tribe to strengthen unity among East Coast Indigenous relations. In 2018, he attended the International Indian Treaty Conference in Bear Butte, South Dakota. Sachem Hawksworm is an advocate for environmental justice and the preservation of indigenous land and waters. He helped lead climate marches in 2014 and 2017, as well as the Native Nations Rise March in 2017. Thank you so much for being here, Sachem. I turn it to you. Oniwe, Wigawa was shown on Kasik Pasek, Masharawa of the Skatakok First Nations peoples. Um, and I'm grateful to be here with all of you, seeing so many uh, names of people that I've done work with or know about some of the work that you're doing. I'm very excited. Um, also very excited to hear from the youth uh, today and work with the youth and hear the things that you guys are doing uh, to protect our water. Um, one of the things that that nature doesn't get is a voice and uh, we need to be that voice. We need to uh, come forward. Some of the things that Scattercoke First Nations have been involved with is, um, is bringing that voice to the voiceless. So uh, what we did for Standing Rock is we sent, we work, uh, we do a lot of work with the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, we work with the International Indian Treaty Council and we supported bringing the Special Rapporteur to the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to investigate human rights violations at Standing Rock. Um, we, uh, one, of, one of our programs was the first ever um, Indigenous Peoples March down in DC where we brought Indigenous peoples from all over the world to march down in DC and spoke and we had Deb Holland there um, and, uh, and a few other pretty amazing voices. Um, and also working very closely with the uh, organizers for the climate marches and the um, climate strike a couple of years back where Greta came and all the youth stood up. And so these are the kinds of things that we know is important especially for environmental justice, uh, bringing the youth's voice forward, uh, stopping the uh, idea that the people that have harmed the environment have the answers in fixing the environment. Um, one of the main projects that Scattercoke First Nations is working towards is land rematriation, a land reclamation project that we're working on uh, bringing back the food systems, uh, clean water, how we're living with the land, um, and part of uh, environmental racism is to remove the people from the land, remove people from their languages and their understanding of where they are on the planet, and then controlling them that way. Uh, so we're trying to work towards fixing that, bringing people back to the land and working on working on bringing the proper foods, medicines, and, and things that we need to survive in the ecosystems that we're in. Uh, so we uh, have a land base uh, out in, in Copake, New York, where we are doing a uh, agro food forestry initiative and working with other groups that have land uh, that are doing amazing practices like this, which restorative justice and restorative uh, agroforestry. Uh, so anyway, uh, I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time, uh, but I'm very excited to be uh, working with, with you guys and uplifting any projects or, or voice that needs to be lifted in this conversation. So, O'Neill way.
Beautiful. Thank you, Sage Hawkstorm. Um, up next, we are going to hear from our in other environmental Briegel, uh, <laughs> environmental mentor, Heather Briegel. Uh, Heather is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and first line descendant Stockbridge Muncie. She is a graduate of Madonna University in Michigan and holds a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in US history. Inspired by a trip to Wounded Knee, South Dakota, a passion for Native American history was born. She has spoken for numerous universities and events, including Indigenous Peoples Day in 2017, the Women's March anniversary in Lansing, Michigan in January 2018, and the first ever Indigenous Peoples March in Washington, DC in January of 2019. She has become the accidental activist and speaks to different groups about intergenerational racism and trauma and helps to bring awareness to our environment, the fight for clean water, and other issues in the Native community. While Heather calls Michigan home, she has recently moved to Wisconsin, driven by her curiosity of her own heritage, and is now the Director of Cultural Affairs for the Stockbridge Muncie community. In addition to that, she, is also she also currently travels and speaks on Native American history, including policy and activism. Thank you for joining us, Heather. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited um, to be part of this. When I was approached to be part of this, my absolute answer was yes, I wasn't even gonna think twice about it. Um, I would like to, before I start talking, just acknowledge that the land that I'm coming to you from today, um, if you were on here yesterday, you'll already know where I'm coming to you from, but I'm coming to you from my home in Northeast Wisconsin, which is located on the ancestral homelands of the Menominee people, who through forced land sessions now reside on a fraction of what their homelands once were. I honor their ancestors past and present by creating a space for learning that is inclusive and equitable for all. I think it's super important to always acknowledge the land that we're on um, and it just honors the past. But um, so I came about uh, to activism in a very, very accidental way, seriously, like I'm not lying about that. Um, prior to that, I mean, I focus a lot on policies, treaties and indigenous law when I am you know, speaking and talking to people, but being from Michigan, where we are surrounded by fresh um, lakes um, all around us, um, you know, water comes up a lot and environmental justice comes up a lot. And when our children in Flint were poisoned by, um, you know, lead leaking into their waters, when the great pediatrician who was there blew the whistle on that. I knew I had to get involved because these are kids we're talking about. Kids in predominantly low income neighborhoods, Flint, uh, Michigan, Detroit, auto capital of the world. We pride ourselves on that. We are not, we're also Motown. So we got like some of the best music and I will fight you all on that. But um, so uh, knowing that, you know, we were surrounded by this water and, and you couldn't drink it. And, um, you know, Detroit was the motor capital. Flint was a huge hub for the industry as well. We had lots of auto plants there, lots of people put to work. When the auto plants started to close, people moved away and what was left were poverty stricken neighborhoods. And so it shouldn't have been a shock when we you know, saw the, the water in Flint being poisoned, but it came as a shock because you, you have children now who are gonna have lifelong issues with lead poisoning. It's gonna affect their mental health, their physical health. It's going to affect the way that they learn. It's going to affect everything about them. So that was, that was my first um, really big you know, wake up call along with Standing Rock. And I appreciate the work that Sachem Hawkstorm and um, his group of co his coalition of people who you know went out there and I I in awe of everything that happened at Standing Rock so um because I don't think I've ever been on a call except yesterday with Sachem I wanted to say personally Onewe Anishik for you to that I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart um so with that and with it not being reported in the mainstream media. You didn't see it. I saw very little of it. I learned most of it through independent media sources um, about what was happening. And that was actually, that sparked the, the, the 
role that I started to play in getting the word out there about talking about what was happening, talking about what was going on. And that's when I delved really into policy and indigenous law, because a lot of that surrounds that. And in the work we do um, with the Stockbridge Muncie community in our historic preservation office is preserving and protecting sites of cultural significance to the Mohican and Muncie people. And water is part of that. The Hudson is part of that, the Mahikanatuk, the river that flows both ways. Um, you know, Mahikana means people of the waters that are never still. And um, I'm also Oneida, so I'm, you know, people of the standing stone. So I like to picture myself as, as a, uh, you know, a large stone sitting in that water. We're not moving. We're going to protect that water every single time. So I think it's a great way to incorporate both of my, um, my uh, ancestors into that. And it's life, water is the source of life. In 2018, when I spoke at the Women's March in Lansing, um, the speech that I gave revolved around water, um, revolved around the importance of it because what was Standing Rock all about? They simply just wanted to move oil under a main source of drinking water for that entire community, not just the Standing Rock community, but everyone who lived around that. Millions of people would have been affected if the Missouri River was then all of a sudden filled with oil because you can't drink oil, you can't live off of that. And so protection of our water sources is so important. It's life, water is a living and breathing organism. It's, it's a living and breathing entity, it's part of who we are. Um, from the moment of conception, like I said yesterday, you're born in water. You, you know, and, and when you come into this world, you're made up of mostly water. Um, and the planet is made up of mostly water. And so to protect that is so important. And I appreciate the youth um, taking on this fight. Uh, you know, we saw, you know, the climate marches that were happening, the, the protection against water, you know, and it's all coming from youth led organizations. And I think that is so amazing. Um, and I think, you know, Sachem would agree with me that, you know, we love that they're coming forward because I think, as I said yesterday, it gives us a much needed, you know, hour or two to take some self care because that's also so important in the fight for the protection of not just the water, but our air, our grass, um, and everything around us, this planet. We are going to be the ones who suffer from it. The planet, it's going to go on and it's going to continue doing what it does. We will be the ones who suffer if everything falls apart and we don't protect our resources around us. So I just want to say thank you to the sanctuary and to Branda and um, you know Amanda and everyone putting this together. I appreciate this and uh, the Water Justice crew and the students who made that amazing film yesterday. Beautiful. And I'm super excited to um, for what the rest of today brings. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. So good to hear. Um, so we are, yes, uh, we will now be um, hearing from our participating youth groups about some of the work um, that they are doing throughout the Hudson River watershed. Um, they'll each be presenting you um, with a little presentation and or video. Um, so we'll get started with the Water Justice Lab. Um, the Water Justice Lab was launched in the midst of the pandemic this past June. Um, this three-year collaboration between Riverkeeper and the Media Sanctuary will establish a water quality sampling lab. Uh, the Water Justice Lab will educate diverse communities about water justice and how to protect our waters develop the advocacy capacity of the North Troy area, and strengthen a network of environmental justice advocates focused on water issues around the Hudson River watershed. They have three wonderful water justice youth scientist fellows who have been participating in monthly sessions since June and who will be conducting, <coughs> conducting water testing and water research along with radio production for the next two years. As I mentioned earlier, the Water Justice Fellows are Genesis Cooper, Shantanik Pollock, and Gabby Espada. And now I will turn it over to them. Hello. Hello. We're the Water Justice crew. We don't really give a brief introduction of like who each of us are. So I'm Genesis, I'm 14. I go to Lansingburg High School and I live next to the Hudson, like about two blocks away in North Troy. 
I'm Gabby. I'm the youngest of you fellows. I'm 14, and I also attend Makerbox uh, Lansingburg <laughs> High School. Uh, hi, I'm Shantanique. I'm 15, and I also attend Lansingburg High School. And basically, what we do is um, what Amanda said is like we try to educate people and like about the river and the environment around them. And so what we have been working on recently is like a little film, kind of like Echoes from Loch One, about the Hudson and its history. And so the film that you're going to see like shortly, like later, is going to be just like us and our personal experiences. You'll hear um, us answering questions about our personal experiences with the Hudson and um, about how we learned about the Hudson and its pollution and how it affects the community. So, yeah. Uh, another thing we talk about briefly is we all talk about um, environmental racism and how the pollution in the water can connect with activism, such as movements like Troy for Black Lives. So we tend to bring cultural into environment. Mm -hmm. You wanna play the video for us? The community out here in Troy isn't very in tune with the water. The river, like we all know it's there, but none of us really pay attention to it. My community's relationship to the water, I don't think is very strong. A lot of us don't visit it or can't really visit it because it's extremely polluted. I didn't really know much about the pollution in the water. I just knew we couldn't drink it. Now that I am researching with Riverkeeper, I was kind of shocked that there was way more in the water. Like, I thought it was just, like, dirty. It felt kind of disappointing because the Hudson River has so much potential to be a wonderful and beautiful place, but it's just really gross. All right, we're walking to the river, boys. This is where we're going. Most people here are black, and then there's some white people here, but then there are also white people that have lower income. We all know the pollution in Troy is bad. We all know the pollution in the Hudson is bad, but we don't know what to do because no one's working to help us. So then it also creates like an unhealthy way of living for the community. I feel like it just makes everyone feel like they're not cared about. Environmental racism is like black and brown people are being affected. So how do you feel that once we finally made it to the river? It's very cold. And the, but the river is very calming. It's very subtle right now. Very calm at the moment. Yeah. Gabby! Hi. <laughs> so currently right now we are on the river and the sun is just setting. So it looks actually pretty beautiful right now. Even though it does look very beautiful, there are still high amounts of pollution in the water and it is not the best it could be. It can be extremely clear and there'll be way more animals here and the river could flourish. So Jen, how do you feel once we finally got to the river? Lit, honestly. Um, well, I knew the river was pretty close, but like, my first time really taking this route to see the river so like I knew it was here just never went on it so now that I'm actually looking at it like really close it's kind of cool do you think that 
a lot of the rest of the community here also haven't really experienced this. To be honest, I don't even think many people know that the river is like right here. Like, if we had no buildings, you'd be able to see the river from far, far away. But with all the buildings and the trees here, no one really knows like what's here. I love being a part of something to help my community, especially with something as big as the water. I hope that the program can get bigger. There's only three of us as of right now, so I hope that a lot more youth will get interested and involved with the river. As for the river, I hope it'll get healthier soon and that we can actually use it, swim in it. My hopes and dreams for the future of my community is I hope we gain a better understanding and relationship with the river. I'm using science to protect and heal the community because one, when you bring science into the equation of a lot of arguments, not a lot of people can like defy science like that. So using science, you can actually make change, which is exactly what the river needs. I hope that uh, more people understand the river and are educated on the river so then they can fight for the river. That was so good. <laughs> thank yeah. you, thank you. Beautiful. Y'all wanna talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, do you want to oh so I was going? just going to say that, um, thank you to Katie for helping us with the yes, Katie and editing. Yes. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, but yeah, I hope I hope you guys like liked listening to us speak about um, our opinions on the river and our relationship with it, because like we said in the video, like we didn't really know much about it before joining Riverkeeper and the Water Justice Lab, and we didn't have much of like an understanding of what was going on, because in school normally we would learn about it. And we would only hear that it was polluted, but we never understood why or how and how we could change that. Uh, another thing about this documentary and like how it came along was we were brainstorming ideas of how to get our message out there to the community. This was when uh, our mentor Jared was with us, but he started coming. We just started throwing ideas out there. And honestly, I came up with the idea as a joke at first, but we ended up starting to like actually work with Katie and getting the shots and scenes together and we seen the trailer and we realized like it wasn't a joke anymore. We were actually going to make this documentary and have our voices heard. Um, but yeah, that's basically where it started because at first we were thinking like, what if we make a movie as like a joke? And then we were like, no, wait, actually we could like educate people through them seeing it visually instead of just speak, speaking to them. Because a lot of people are visual learners more than they are just like being able to listen. So if they see that the river is like that close to them and that they can make a change and that people our age are working to help the river, maybe they can too. Uh, I hope with our documentary and even have some parts in our documentary showing more of the community and like Genesis said how we don't really learn about it and I hope more youth get to do stuff like we're doing and help spread awareness about anything that matters to them anything they think needs change and for us that is water justice so are there any questions yeah. for us Um, 
I haven't seen any pop up in the chat, but if folks want to drop some questions in there, that'd be great. I think in the meantime, maybe if uh, Katie and Jared would like to introduce themselves so we hear a little bit about who uh, has helped guide this process or, or just, yeah, uplifted it. Um, Katie, would you like to go first? Sure. Um... I just met the Water Justice crew a couple months back when they proposed this idea of the documentary and I had been a sanctuary intern in the past doing some photo and video and that was what I studied in college as well so I was really excited to join them in this journey. Uh, I think it's going to become a much larger project over the next few months because the Nature Lab uh, is going to be opening and they're actually going to be using that facility and so I'm really excited to see them uh, engaging with the science more because just this past month we have mostly been just working on um, creating this like sense of place and talking more about the history of the place before they're actually going to get a chance to get their hands dirty and doing that citizen science work so I'm really excited. Awesome. Jared. Hi, my name is Jared and I, I'm the science mentor for the Water Justice Lab. And uh, I worked with the fellows from about June until November. Oh, and I forgot to say, I'm coming to you now from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is the ancestral homeland of the Susquehannock peoples. And um, in November, I came here to Lancaster uh, for a job working in a laboratory which measures water quality. Uh, but back in the day with the fellows, uh, we spent a lot of time learning about the, the, you know, the various local issues of water justice and global issues. And really, um, you know, with a background in science, the, the justice aspect was new for me. And with the events of the summer, uh, it, our attention really turned to the the intersection of environmental and social justice issues. So, so I learned a lot uh, working with the fellows. Awesome. Um, so we have had a couple of questions pop up in the chat for you all. Um, coming from Emily, what was the most surprising thing you learned this year? Um, I think, we'll, should we go like in order? Um, for me, the most surprising thing I learned this year was how polluted the river actually was. Like I knew it was very bad, but to the point where like we can't even like the catch and release and stuff like we can't even touch the water. So without getting sick or some sort of disease, that was really kind of shocking for me. For me, the most surprising thing I learned was like, I kind of understood, but I didn't really have a full grasp on how environmental issues directly can connect to social issues. And now I think that's one of my biggest things I'm interested in, like, teaching people about and educating myself on. Because I, like, I've been working with my dad, who works for what was formerly known as Justice for Dominique, but is now Troy for Black Lives. And in my family, I've always had that connection towards fighting for change, but I didn't understand how it could be environment, environmental and social and connect directly. Uh, for me, I found it surprising of how big a disconnect the river had with its community. And I just found that really crazy that we all live less than a mile away from the river but we have no interaction with it. That's awesome. And I think that feeds into another piece of a question that was dropped in here um, asking, now that you've like connected to the river, how often you're, you're walking the river now, how often you plan on visiting it? Um, well, we, with working with Water Justice, we're obviously going to be visiting it a lot more now. So we're going to get to understand and connect to it. Uh, which is very helpful and moving on our part because we're so we're so young and we get to know more about 
the river that has been there for almost since before we were even born. Before all of us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and uh, the thing is, I feel that it's, uh, I don't know, just like a step in like learning about new things. Like it can be more than just the river. It can be about like streams that are connected to the river. It can be about like mountains that the river water runs off of and the animals that live next to the river. So I feel like, like I've been around nature a lot. So I feel like I'm gonna be visiting the river a lot more than I used to. And maybe even like bring other people around my age to visit the river and educate them more about about the river. Um, I've always kind of been around the river. Like me and my brother and my dad would always canoe or we'll fish over there. But with water justice, I am now actually visiting the water to help make it better and have more people start doing activities I would do on the river, like fishing and canoeing and just hanging around. Awesome. Um, there was one more, one other question. Um, how you picked this particular spot on the river? Um, and I think Brenda would love to highlight, or I think it, it's important that we highlight um, that, uh, you know, this is the closest spot to the river from your homes and is a sacred burial ground of the Stockbridge Muncie community. Yeah, we um we chose that spot because um I live closest to the river, but so do the girls, so do the other two, but um I live only a block away. And so we decided that we wanted to go to a place where it was accessible for us all. So we kind of met halfway through where the girls would walk and where I would walk. And that's how we got the general idea of where we wanted to start shooting. Yeah, we all decided to shoot because um, there's different spots where people can go to the river and see it. So we all decided to film in spots that are closest to us. So Shane Geek and I live pretty close. So we had generally the same spot where we were going to film which was also, I believe, Heather said it was Unawat's castle, like in er that area. And I think Heather could probably speak more on that because we didn't really know much. But uh, yeah, then we, when we found out that it was um, Unawat's castle, we were like, oh, so like, this is where the original indigenous people were and we're here right now. And we live this close to this, um, like, cultural area like <laughs> we didn't know much about it for, at first uh going off of what genesis just said uh we weren't really picking off of like we were picking off our destinations because it was more efficient and easier that way but the fact that we had no clue these were sacred spots and that there was so much information so close that we had no idea of is kind of weird especially since we've all lived here most of our lives well i think i think we're good now yeah thank you thank you for yes. the yeah thank you thank you for taking those questions beautiful um Sweet. So now we're going to move into a presentation from the Kingston YMCA Farm Project. Um, and just so you all know, I am noting that we uh, that there are some unanswered questions in here. And if we have time at the end, we will uh, jump back into those. Um, but so the Kingston YMCA Farm Project's mission is to educate, nourish, and connect the Kingston community with their urban farm. Their vision is to use the farm as a way to engage young people in the magical and empowering process that is food production. Children and youth are involved in all aspects of food production and farm care, seeding, transplanting, watering, weeding, harvesting, and ultimately preparing and eating. They have farm stands on Tuesdays and Thursdays where they make the produce as accessible as possible for their community. Participants learn how to turn their, the vegetables they grow into healthy snacks and dishes. 
They're committed to racial and economic justice and are working to create a more equitable food system for all. As they do this, they find different ways for the youth to make change in the Kingston community. This past summer, they started a book club. Um, where since then, they have read Stamped the Remix by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi, as well as How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. The crew has also sent letters to elected officials, installed a Say Their Names memorial, and uh, painted two utility boxes with anti-racist messages, initiated a countywide Sojourner Truth Day, and more. Um, and we thank them for being here today. Why, crew, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica from the YMC Farm Project. Um, Brie, Isaiah, I'll let you introduce yourselves. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Brianna from the YMCA Farm Project. And I'm Isaiah from the YMCA Farm Project. And we, I'm, I'm basically just going to be like showing two, two slideshows and walking you guys through what we do, who we are. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but I, I, I don't have access to that. <laughs> The tech crew will work to, to figure Hi, that now. out. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, so the first one. Um, it's loading. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay there we go <laughs> okay so I'm gonna start off by just giving a, a kind of brief explanation of what we do and who we are um so I'm Brianna from the YMCA Farm Project and we're an organization that works with 14 to 18 year olds uh, and we provide the youth with meaningful employment as opposed to just like you know a typical uh nine to five job or something that's not very, uh, I guess, engaging. Um, and our goal is to provide our community with fresh food because there's a lack of access to healthy food in Midtown. Uh, and I live in Midtown and we basically have a lot of like fast food stores and we don't have a lot of access to, uh, you know, the grocery store and stuff like that, um, which puts uh, black and brown people in this area who are low income at a complete disadvantage because uh, they don't have that type of access to, you know, foods that are good for their health, um, which is why it's important that we uh, work on the farm that's behind the YMCA, uh, and we sell our uh, vegetables and stuff in the YMCA, because uh, it's kind of like a, I guess, like a midpoint where people can have uh, easy access to us, um, and on the farm, we learn how to care for vegetables in their early stages all the way up into when it's time for us to pick them, and prepare them for the YMCA farm stand. Uh, and the teens also get to um, sell back to the community and kind of get that connection with the people who they live around. And it's nice that people get to see that we're doing something uh, good for them. And together we learn how to grow food, work as a team and provide our local community with food. And right now our farm winter uh, stand is on Thursdays, 3.30 to six o'clock in the YMCA lobby in Kingston, New York. Um, and also right now we're doing our winter cooking crew, which is my favorite thing to do because we get to eat. And right now we're working in a really, really fancy kitchen. <laughs> it's like a, commer a commercial uh, like baking kitchen and it's really big. And we're learning how to make all these different recipes with the vegetables that we grow on the farm. And right now we're actually working on making a cookbook, which is super fun. And we're trying out a bunch of different recipes every week and we get to try them and eat them and we get feedback to kind of tweak how we're gonna, I guess, formulate our cooking book. Uh, and that's been a lot of fun. So now I'm gonna pass it over to the next person and thank you. Yes, um, something else that we do um, with the youth crew is um, Bark, which uh, kind of sprung up in like, spring of 2019, maybe even earlier. Um, it basically stands for beautifying and restoring Kingston. And the youth are employed to 
basically do a bunch of things around Kingston from trash pickup to um, painting uh, areas or to planting flowers. Um, this is a picture of, of one of the, well, we usually do it on Mondays um, in the spring and summer. Um, so this is one of our Mondays before we headed out to go pick up some in Midtown. Um, uh, this is another project we did um, where we planted trees, uh, native trees um, in kind of on the side of where our, our garden is. Um, so there was a lot of like Japanese knotweed coming up and it was kind of like invading our farm. So we were like putting these not only to like provide habitat and, and you know, clean air for, for the area, but also to like hopefully stop that Japanese knotweed from, you know, being so, you know, getting out of control. Um, this is us uh, planting some sunflowers um, in the Y parking lot. Um, there was like no nothing there before. <laughs> it was kind of just like dead space. Um, this is another bed we planted flowers and sunflowers in in a park uh, in Midtown Kingston that also had nothing in it. So we thought we'd just kind of bring some life there. And this is some more trash pickup stuff. And this is when we um, met <laughs> the mayor to kind of to air our uh, music video that I'll talk about later. It, the music video was like about trash clean clean up. <laughs> it was pretty corny, but also really fun. Um, um, this is more of us uh, transplanting plants and flowers um, with the camp that uh, is at the Y in the summer. Um, this is us kind of uh, painting, kind of reviving a, a local park, uh, Van Buren Park in Midtown Kingston that really had like not a lot of color vibrancy before. Um, uh, this is us doing that. <laughs> Um, and us cleaning up some uh, planters in Uptown Kingston that were kind of neglected. Um, um, this is us painting uh, another little parklet uh, in Kingston that was, you know, really cracked and like dry. Um, we added some some fun colors, some fun activities there. <laughs> um, this is uh, when we met the mayor and actually Emily Vale, who I believe is on this call. Um, to discuss the bioswales in Uptown Kingston. There's three and we were basically uh, asked to kind of revamp it because it was, it, was, it was really neglected. So we, we, and for those of you who don't know, bioswales are like a, a natural like filtration system of like storm runoff. Um, so there's like less pollution in the, in the river eventually. Um, and so we, we planted native perennials in those bioswales. Um, and we weeded, it took a very long time. Like these, these bioswales were like, oh my gosh, it was, it was kind of scary going into it, but we weeded it all. Um, and we planted those native perennials and this is us planting more flowers in the Kingston YMCA uh, parking lot. Um, us planting those perennials in the bioswales. Um, this is the crew visiting the Ulster County Resource Recovery Center, where we learned about how our county recycles, what's recyclable, things like that, and the importance of recycling. Um, and we even have we even had like a, a youth kind of led business per se. Um, we sold the youth were we're responsible for uh, getting in touch with local businesses such as Turn Up The Beat. Um, this is Stephen who owns Turn Up The Beat in the middle and uh, basically selling them <laughs> like vegetables that we grow such as kale, spinach, whatever he needs. Um, and uh, another project we worked on uh, building pollinator habitats because as we know, pollinators are super important to the environment. Um, this was a lot of fun, they still sand um, at the farm today, so that's great. Um, and this is actually what we worked with Sebastian from Hudson uh, Hudson Valley Riverkeeper. Oh, one second. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, 
of Sebastian from Hudson Valley Riverkeeper. Um, we we made storm drain stencils. Um, they were they were pretty neat, pretty fun to paint with to to spray paint. Uh, they, I still like walk uptown and they're still there. And this was like a year ago almost, or I think like oh, maybe a year or more ago. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, we, we did um, Spanish and English uh, phrases there. And this is um, a utility box. Um, we painted three utility boxes in Kingston. Um, so this was one right by the YMCA where we, uh, the theme was missing stories, so we told, uh, we basically painted some uh, things on there that kind of many Kingston residents are unfamiliar with. So Sojourner Truth um, was very close to Kingston. She walked to the Kingston courthouse to free her uh, illegally enslaved son. Um, and this is a post office that used to stand where uh, a Planet Wings now is. Um, so this is um, another project we worked on, the African burial ground in Kingston, um, where, well, Isaiah, you were part of this. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. So here we uh, designed a memorial for a forgotten burial ground for enslaved people. And so this burial ground wasn't like a cemetery. It was basically in like someone's backyard. And so we worked with a group called Harambe who bought the um, property. And so they wanted a group of youth, youth to design the uh, uh, memorial for it. Yeah, and this is the youth that did that. Um, and this is um, <laughs> a while ago when we made a, a, a song and music video to uh, about trash pickup. It was called Trash Talk and that was really fun. Um, and we aired it. Um, if you want to go on YouTube and try to find it, you're welcome to. Uh, I believe that is all. Um, this is our social media information. If you want to give us a follow or keep uh, updated on what we're doing, um, I'm going to stop sharing and then share another video. Um, uh, that's just like a, a slideshow. Isaiah can say some things about it before I play. And so this slideshow is basically like pictures of what we did over the summer. And so like you'll see a group of us like reading in a circle at our farm. And then you'll see just a bunch of pictures of us working basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna share the computer sound. You don't hear it or something. Awesome. That was pretty quick. See, um, so yeah, the, the, those are the. That's what we have for you today. Uh, we're excited. To conference going. Talk more about environmental justice, water justice in the Hudson Valley. Oh, there's some some questions. Some questions. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to uh, bounce some of these questions to you all before we move on. First, I just want to say thank you all for the beautiful work that you're doing because I, as a resident of Kingston, get to enjoy so much of it as I just walk around the sunflowers and the storm drains and all of that is just so good to see all the time. Um, so thank you. Um, 
so I saw a question in here. Uh, first, first question was about Japanese knotweed and uh, someone was looking on advice on how, I know that that is a tricky subject, but if y'all could just talk about how you uh, battled that in the farm area. Okay. <laughs> uh, I for, well, from what I remember, I remember we went in and we cut them all down. It took a while and I think they were pretty strong, but we chopped them down. And I even think we covered them with like tarp and then like put like, I guess, wood chips on them from what I remember. And then it also helped to put those trees there. That way they wouldn't be so aggressive. Uh, but it was definitely uh, difficult. They definitely put up a fight uh, and it took some time. But that's what I remember from dealing with the knotweed. I don't know if Jessica wants to add yeah they're still not it's still not gone like let me just say you're probably not gonna be able to get rid of that now weed I'm just saying like the trees like helped for a little like the tarp and the wood chips helped for a little but they ended up you know getting back so that's just yeah. that's just the way it is <laughs> totally fair um so someone else has asked do you uh commented that that the bark crew is doing such a really beautiful like wide range of projects um and how you how you decided on the projects um does the staff pick them or do you all brainstorm on them yeah it's more so a brain it's more so just like being since we live in kingston looking around us and seeing like what the issues are and then like we all conversate together as like a youth crew about like what we can do uh, and how we can make it better. So it's definitely more of like a conversation between all of us as like how we can collaborate and, you know, make things better. And we also collaborate with other people in the community who want to be, you know, a part of what we're doing. Nice. Um, awesome. And I think we'll, we'll do one more question and then move on. Um, I think this one's really important. Uh, do you see a relationship between the work that you're doing and the Hudson River or water in general? Yeah, I would say so, because in, in especially with the bios wheels and the storm drain stuff, um, we realize that there there is a lot of like pollution going into the Hudson River. And, you know, obviously um, the Hudson Valley kind of is just like known for the Hudson River and like the water, this, you know, the beautiful water, even though lately, like, it's not really <laughs> all that beautiful. Like, I, I thought it was funny watching the the water justice crew um, in the in their video, talk about like how gross the water is, because I feel like there there's like actually a beach um, in downtown Kingston, it's called Kingston Point Beach, and people swim in it, like, I think it's okay to swim in it because people swim in it. But like my so many of my friends just refuse to even step foot in there because they think it's so gross and I guess it is pretty it does you know it's not blue but I mean yeah so I thought that was funny because I could definitely relate to that I definitely heard some of that stuff um but yeah I, I definitely think that um our work definitely connects you know I feel like a lot of social justice issues um intersect in some way because they're all I don't know, they all meet at some, you know, crossroads. So I'm excited to connect more with them. Awesome. Um, Bree or Isaiah, do you, either of you have anything to add to that before we? Yeah, kind of like what uh, Jess just said about how like they all intersect. It kind of made me think of how like whenever there's issues in the environment, like you know, uh, black and brown people, you know, and low income people seem to suffer the most. So I feel like that always like directly goes back into environmental racism and into social justice work, because if our, like if mother nature is, you know, suffering, it usually is those people who also suffer, you know, directly from it too. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see Isaiah on here anymore. Oh, there you are. Did you want to add anything to that before we move on? Um, I think um, I should add that we also like did like fun trips to the water and like we put on waders and we got in the water and caught like the little fish with the big net. And I think that was cool to see like what was in the water. 
That's awesome. Glad you guys got to connect to it. Well, um, so we are going to go on to hear from the green team, Groundwork Hudson Valley's green team. Yes, a uh, round of applause for you all. Thank you. Um, great. So the the green Hudson Valley Groundwork or Groundwork Hudson team program uh, hires majors enrolled in the Yonkers Public System for environmental jobs, uh, many their first real job. The program focuses on leadership, group dynamics, and a variety of conservation and construction skills. This hard work is tempered with amazing adventures like hiking, camping, and swimming. The green team begins their summer work in Yonkers with projects that include building community gardens, cleaning the Sawmill River, removing invasive species, and mapping a new bike trail. They learn firsthand how to make a real difference in their neighborhoods. To put this work in context, the green team also spends time working on public lands. These trips include wilderness camping, canoeing, and night hikes, as well as trail restoration and park conservation in places like Yellowstone National Park, the Grand Canyon, Gateway National Recreation Area, and Wallkill National Wildlife Refuge. Working alongside National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Rangers, this program opens participants up to a variety of career opportunities. For some, it is the launching pad for a career in conservation. Now I will turn it over to Diana and Emperatriz. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Cocal. And my name is Emperatriz Ojeda. And we are part of Groundwork Cuts and Valley's green team. Today, we'll be talking about urban heat and how climate impacts are disproportionately distributed. But first, let me get into why we are here today. I lived in Yonkers for the past five years. In the summer of my freshman year, I was looking for volunteering opportunities. One of my friends introduced me to a place called the Science Barge, and I fell in love. I became invested in my environment and the social issues involved and soon I was introduced to the green team. I just knew I wanted to work as a green teamer. So I reached out to Victor and to my lucky surprise, I got the job. I was born and raised in Yonkers, but I have two immigrant parents that come from Mexico. I wanted to get, I wanted to get more involved in environmental justice because in Puebla, Mexico City, where my mom's from, there aren't many mitigation strategies to combat the negative effects of high surface temperatures. This has led to many heat related health conditions in the population. This is extremely concerning because the nearest hospitals are located one to two hours away. And as a result, many individuals have died on their way to an urgent care facility. Why do you think high surface temperatures affect cities more? It has to do with something called the urban heat island effect, which causes an urban or metropolitan area to be significantly warmer than its surrounding rural areas due to human activities. Heat is created by energy and from all the people, cars, buses, and trains. Let's take a closer look at the demographics of Yonkers. Yonkers is New York's fourth largest city and the largest in Westchester County. It has a large population of Black and Latino people with 16% of people living in poverty. Climate impacts are not shared equally. Disadvantaged groups are more at risk to exposure, have an increase in susceptibility to damage, and have a decrease in their ability to cope and recover from the climate-related damage suffered. Why are certain areas more vulnerable to heat? Certain elements of our built environment increase the risk of extreme heat. Let's take a look at four of those risk factors. One risk factor for urban heat is surface temperature. The surface temperature in Yonkers is between 107 degrees and 175 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface temperature is a temperature we feel when we are outside. It can have a 10 to 20 degree difference from the actual weather temperature. This is a big deal because heat is the number one cause of weather related deaths. This difference in temperature is a result of the elements that make up the surface. Next slide. Yonkers has a high percentage of impervious surfaces. Impervious surfaces are mainly artificial structures like roads and parking lots that are made up of asphalt or concrete. They prevent areas from cooling off quickly and cause us to feel heat longer throughout the day where we would otherwise cool down. They also cause rainwater to accumulate and flow rapidly into storm drains, which result in severe harm to streams. What if instead of impervious surfaces, we had tree canopy? Tree canopy refers to trees, specifically how much trees are around an area. 
Trees help reduce surface temperatures by providing shade. In the absence of tree canopies, surface temperatures are recorded to be higher than weather temperatures because the sun's energy is absorbed by impervious surfaces and re-released during the night, instead of being absorbed by trees and converted into food. But the physical environment isn't the only thing putting people at risk. We also have to consider how we adapt to increasing temperatures in our daily lives and what people are more at risk. Why is poverty a risk factor for heat? Low income people can't afford to buy an air conditioner for every room. Some can't even afford to buy one air conditioner. Unlike, income, unlike high income individuals, they do not have enough money or resources. They have to feed their families, pay rent for electricity and water, and the basic, all the basic necessities a human being needs to survive. However, sometimes the money they receive from working long hour shifts isn't enough to provide them with those necessities. Many low income families have to bear the heat indoors. As a result, they are put more at risk for developing heat related health conditions and visiting the hospital isn't an option for them. They endure the pain they feel knowing that if they enter a hospital, they'll leave with years of debt and no way to pay for other expenses. Poverty is an adaptive measure because people who do, don't have enough money are less able to adapt to changing heat and climate. This means that impoverished individuals have a high percentage of vulnerability. Now let's take a closer look at why these neighborhoods look the way they do. This slide shows a heat vulnerability map. Blue is low vulnerability and red is high vulnerability, typically caused by more impervious surfaces and less greenery. But the question is, why do some areas have more concrete and fewer trees than others? Well, after the Great Depression, many Americans were left homeless, jobless, and with little to their name. So when Franklin D. Roosevelt took office, he created a number of federal programs to help Americans get back on their feet. One of them was called the National Housing Program, which involved a 30-year mortgage with low fixed interest rate to, help, to make home buying more accessible to people of lower income. This sounds great, right? Except residential security maps graded neighborhoods based on their perceived financial risk. With green being the lowest risk investment and the red being the highest risk, these neighborhoods are typically communities of color. Now let's put things together. Residential security maps create exclusionary zones, making it difficult for anyone in those zones to acquire bank loans to purchase properties in the redlined areas or to leave those areas, leading to a lack of investment in the well-being of physical development of these neighborhoods, hence the term redlining. This is why we see fewer green spaces in these areas. Because of their low income value, these properties receive fewer taxes, which means less funding for public spaces. Not to mention the fact that these areas were already high risk from the start. In Yonkers, the hottest five neighborhoods are Glenwood, Lamartine Heights, Bradford, Old Seventh Ward, and Nodine Hill, which is where I live. Ironically enough, these neighborhoods were once redlining zones and hold a larger black and Latino population compared to the rest of Yonkers. The heat vulnerability index that we see on slide seven shows the hot, hottest areas in Yonkers. As you can see, it's those five areas. But there's still a way we can help with the right use of mitigation strategies. For instance, tree canopy. Tree canopy regulates the climate by providing shade and protection from the harsh sun rays. It's on the pricier side, but its long-term effectiveness means initial costs will weigh less in the long run. With prices ranging from 50 to 200 per acre, tree canopy will be around for hundreds of years and won't need much maintenance. If you're looking for something short-term and less costly, cool roofs and pavements are the way to go. With prices ranging 30 to 40 cents per square foot, cool roofs and pavements are great substitutes for the traditional concrete and asphalt surfaces. There will have to be yearly maintenance, but surface temperatures will be significantly lower than with the traditional means, since less heat will be trapped by the lighter colored surfaces. Green roofs have the qualities of tree canopy and cool roofs combined, but it's expensive. Going from 10 to $20 a square foot, prices do begin to add up. However, they're great for air city areas with lots of buildings that can't afford to give up space for traditional gardens. Like the previous mitigation strategies mentioned, green roofs are the best of both worlds. By trapping less heat and releasing clean air back into the cities, green roofs are a great alternative. However, just having these mitigation strategies isn't enough. Our politicians greatly affect who and where receives funding and resources. How can we as citizens be assured that our politicians will have our best interests at heart? How will we know that the areas that need the most help will receive it? The answer is research and voting. Figure out who's running for mayor or who's running for council. See if their policies align with what we need. 
See if their voting record matches what they preach. Write letters to your central office and make your voices heard. And that's it. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns. That's really amazing work. Good job, guys. Um, I did see one question pop up here, which is really a good question. Um, just speaking to how your research is super impressive. Um, have you been able to incorporate this work into your school projects and are you supportive of this work if you have been? Diana, do you wanna go first? Um, so for my school project, I wouldn't say that I have incorporated this just because we're doing online. So school is kind of different now. So, um, from that perspective, no. Um, but I do, I do think that this research um, is important, and I think that it could make a big impact in our communities. And I hope that people um, speak up more about this issue and bring it to attention, bring it to the attention of people in power, so change can be made. Okay. Um. For schoolwork, no, I haven't used this information, but only because none of the classes that I have now align with this. So I don't have the chance to, if I could, I would. But when it comes to people I know or friends or family who you know don't really know much or they wanna know, like I'll definitely tell them. And I have had that conversation before with people who don't really know about redlining, who don't really understand how racism has infected um, just neighborhoods in general and how people live their day-to-day -day lives and the basic knowledge, like basic knowledge, but that information, they just don't know it because it's never really been taught. And it's crazy to me because it's such an important thing and affects so many people's lives to this day. Um, so no, I haven't used it for class, but I will use it in day-to-day -day life if I need to. If I could just kind of add as uh, so hi for those that didn't um, see me I my name is Victor Medina I'm the youth program manager uh, here at Groundwork Hudson Valley. Um, I want to echo the sentiment of everybody who's saying so awesome job um, and Beatriz and Diana. Uh, just to kind of fuel the idea of the project, this is really a project um, that is uh, happening outside of uh, not only in Groundwork Hudson Valley, but is part of a larger climate safe neighborhoods initiative that the national network is pushing in cities around the country. Um, and so sort of our next steps for this project as part of the Green Team program is going to be going into uh, communities and um, really making them aware and bringing those voices to the table um, so that their local legislatures are held accountable um, to not only fix the problem, but to address them in a way that the community is seeing is fit, as opposed to this top down, this is what we think is the fix. Um, but really making this a grass, uh, try to build this as a grassroots effort. So green team's role in that is in part being sort of that frontline generation who's most going to be most affected by climate change um, and helping pioneer some of the outreach to that, um, uh, to our, our greater audience in, in Yonkers and of course to our elected officials. So this is just part one of that. Um, and this is a, a job that they've been working on from the earlier parts of the summer and have adapted to all things considered in the midst of uh, public health crises um, at works, in the works. Thank you, Victor. I think I'm going to uh, throw one more question to the youth here and then we'll move on to our breakout groups. Um, do you think these projects are going to affect your choices in college or your careers in the future? I think for me personally, it has impacted me in a big way. Um, actually been, um, before this program, I was in Girls Who Code. So I also learned a little bit about computer um, and coding. Um, and I kind of been, because I'm a senior in high school and so I've been looking into what career I want to um, get into. And being a part of Green um, Groundwork Hudson Valley, it has also made me interested in maybe pursuing a career in environmental, um, environmental, um, sorry, um, I had it in my head, but I'm forgetting, um, um, and 
environmental engineering. There we go. So I've been interested in maybe looking into a career in that field. Um, before green team, I would, or like before my introduction to like groundworks in general, because I did do volunteering for them. Um, I never really considered the idea of maybe going into maybe environmental justice or just like the environment in general. Um, but since I have been in it, like it really has opened my eyes to so many issues um, and just like how people live their lives day to day. And I don't know, to me personally, that like, I don't like seeing that. So I would definitely want to do something in that area, maybe environmental justice, because it's something that I feel like shouldn't be a problem like people shouldn't um have to be put in such low living extent quality like have li be living in such like a low quality life because of issues you know pol political issues it's just crazy crazy to me like how living standards are greatly affected because of environmental issues and political issues so i definitely would love to do something maybe in that area so yeah i do think it has affected me I think, I think that's so awesome. Um, I thank you both so much for that. That's great. I think now we're going to move on to our uh, breakout groups. Um, so just so everyone is, um, just to just to orient everyone here, uh, we'll be breaking out into three different sessions where um, our uh, youth participants will be split up into each of those groups. And we'll be focusing on discussing um, how racism shows up in the environmental movement, um, how we can work to radically shift uh, how environmental justice is typically addressed, um, but also how we can incorporate uh, self-care into our work in this greater fight um, because that is something that came up last night and and I think it is just so important for us to be aware of is that um, we're taking care of ourselves while we while we fight this bigger fight so just uh, food for thought for everyone to think about and and yeah we're gonna we're gonna break up and then come back together and report back on any concrete action items that we have uh, uncovered in that conversation. It looks like we're the first people back. We're <laughs> who was it? Was it Sam who was going to say something? Do we have time while we wait? No, it's all good. Actually, one of the things is related to the uh, social media route. So all covered. Great idea. Well, thought we had five more minutes there. I guess there was. And Hi. Sneak here had a big thumbs up for the YouTube channel versus the podcast. It seems like there's many levels of action needed at the advocacy at the, the local area as well as national politics. Um, but what struck me is the isolation from nature the map showing where there isn't any tree canopy and the, the water justice team saying that they never went to the river. So it seems like advocating for um, vest pocket parks and small green spaces might be one, one idea too. While we're waiting, I just wanna say all three presentations have been so very, very impressive. The, the videos, the projects, as well as every participant's ability to talk about what you're learning. So thank you very much for sharing with us. I think, are we all back from the breakout groups now? They ended a little bit earlier than I thought we were going to, but um, that is fine. I hope you all had some good conversations there and came up with some stuff. So I, um, right now we're gonna move into kind of a report back from that, uh, from those breakout groups. 
Um, I will be highlighting the voices of our uh, youth groups here as well as the environmental mentors. So if maybe, um, maybe we can, I'm gonna share my screen. I'll be recording any action items that you all have come up with, but if we wanna start off with group one, maybe uh, reporting back on what they figured out or thought of. Group one, are you with me? Yeah, do you wanna hear from the youth in our group? Um, I would love to hear your voice as well. So um, whoever would like to start, yeah. Okay. Um, I think a lot of what came up was um, access to information, um, free prior and informed consent, uh, access to clean foods. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and ask one of our youth if they can, they can continue. Um, we also talked about solutions that we could, um, implement to make, um, to reduce environmental racism. Can you um, expand on that a little bit? Um, so we kind of talked about how we could um, get this across to younger um, individuals. So someone brought up a podcast and we were um, talking about how that has some positives, some, some negatives. Um, I disagreed with the podcast idea because I feel like a lot of youth um, isn't, they, they don't really listen to podcasts much they usually go on social media and I think that would be a better way to um, send information to them um, using that platform. Awesome. Yeah, um, also like going off of that, um, I mentioned the idea of maybe having like some type of website or something where uh, different youth groups, uh, you know, in New York can, or really anywhere can kind of uh, talk about like what they're doing and like how they can, um, like, I guess ways other people can uh, help and we can kind of bounce ideas off of each other. And also like if everybody like who's doing something in their town can like, I guess, create some type of website where they uh let people know issues that are going going around locally and how they can contribute because that also kind of goes into like you know a lack of information on like knowing what's going on and how you can help and it's kind of hard to I guess combat these issues if you don't really know like what's happening so if we just had some type of way of letting people know like hey here's some like issues that are going on around us like here's some groups that are working towards it and how you can contribute I guess. So then other groups that already have websites could actually link into that website and, and form more of a community of, of organizing, um, especially with the youth and, and with uh, what we're doing um, locally, regionally, and, and nationally, and internationally, really. Anyone else from group one? Um, I, you all mentioned, or was there any uh, related action items with the access, well, access to information falls with this information sharing. So access to clean food. Um, yeah. Um... So we talked about the fact that uh, most of these uh, communities are low, low income communities or communities of color uh, are where you're going to find the fast food restaurants and uh, like Dollar General stores and stuff like that. And um, 
when you don't have access to clean foods and if clean foods are more expensive in those areas and you're talking about mostly low income areas uh, that you're going to get more sicknesses like obesity, diabetes, stuff like that. Um, we also talked about when we get information, how are we getting the information or, and how can information be given in a more ex um, accessible way, more fun way, more um, intriguing way to, to youth uh, instead of using all the scientific mumbo jumbo, but actually to like identify with, with your community and how you're, how you're bringing the information. Uh, so those are two important things that that came up. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we'll move on to group two. Yeah, so group two, I had group two. Uh, best group, in my opinion. No, just kidding. Um, we talked You weren't about there for the other groups. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm excited to hear from everyone. But um, so in group two, we actually discussed the intersectionality between environmental racism, sense, sense of or lack of sense of community, and food sovereignty slash food deserts. And so um, it was that was, it was a lot of information and it was a really good discussion. And so I am going to leave it to um, my water justice crew to talk about um, a little bit of what we discussed and then some action items that we wanted to put in place. So if the water justice crew would go ahead and take it from here. Um, a little bit more about what we discussed was the food deserts was one of the main things and how low income communities such as like the place we live, we don't have good construction or anything like that. And we also don't have uh, access to healthier foods such or places like Walmart or Target or something like that. Uh, another thing we talked about was, we talked about not having uh, places for like kids or communities to get together, like Knickerbocker pool was being shut down. Uh, the skating rink got shut down. Uh, so we just talked about lack of community and um, the gardens that we have out here in Troy. There's actually quite a few to, quite a few of them that are open to the public, but they're locked and nobody really has access to them. So yeah, we that's basically most of what we talked about. Um, but there are some ways that can kind of help with these situations. A lot of the problems, especially like with the gardens being locked, it makes a lot of people feel unwelcome to come and go into these areas and they don't want to get in trouble for just trying to like go in the garden or hang out somewhere because especially since there's already all this violence and there's always like police running around getting people and a lot of kids don't know where they can or can't hang out. So that's one of the biggest issues with people not feeling welcome in certain areas. Yeah, and they also discussed a little bit about, um, you know, with access to the gardens, making sure that people feel welcomed in the gardens. I think there was, um, so it's great that there are community gardens, but being able to feel welcomed, I think, is, is something that's important. So you guys want to touch a little bit more on that and how to have access to those gardens? Um, yeah, um, Capital Roots puts locks on the community gardens, like the gates to them. So taking those locks down would be one of the biggest steps. Um, fence, I mean, you can keep fences up, but like having an open entrance. So that way people like a welcoming entrance, like with a sign and everything that says welcome. And maybe more promotion towards those gardens for people to maybe make their own spot in the garden because like we mentioned earlier there's not really a sense of welcome and uh it feels like a private garden more than it's um a community garden mm -hmm. and like um about the food deserts we were talking about how there's not much um education towards like healthy meals in the community nor is there access to those meals because there's not many grocery stores for right. blocks it's mainly bodegas and most people have to take the bus because there's not a lot of 
people with cars because it's a pretty lower income community. And when people take food from those corner stores, they're not as healthy. And most kids don't know how to cook like healthy meals because they're just getting quick, fast, easy meals. And maybe more education about food and how to make more healthier food with those resources from these gardens could help. And I don't know, I just feel like a lot of kids don't know how to make healthier meals and it leads to a lot of unhealthy like conditions for them and their families mm -hmm. because all they're, all they're um, available to is fast, easy, microwavable meals or corner store meals that really won't help them in the long run. They mm -hmm. don't have any nutritional value and there's not a lot of, like the main issue is there's not a lot of a lot of education and I think we focus on that a lot where where there's not a lot of education and everything links together at the end of the day like no matter what topic there is it's all in a, a chain that just keeps wrapping and wrapping and wrapping around um, thank you thank you for that um with with uh considering our, our time constraints here we're coming up on three o'clock and i still want to squeeze in a little more conversation but if group three if our youth from group three could uh chime in here with some of the actions you may have identified for we're talking about talked about communicating with the community and helping them with like with their food and yeah I feel like um, maybe like more workshops, like 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 what workshops that are like actually like like I don't know, marketed towards lower income neighborhoods so they like, they know about them, you know that type of thing. Like more workshops on on like um, you know maybe like how to cook with healthy food. Maybe like um, like workshop on like how to build a garden bed or how to um like have like maybe an indoor garden um um also i feel like if if like people just i feel like there's strength in numbers so like if people just kind of just like got a group of friends together and you know decided on like one maybe like for instance like a community fridge like to help with like food insecurity if if you wanted like a to like you know bring a community fridge into troy or yonkers um i know kingston has two um um maybe like kind of just getting like a band of people together and like you guys just focusing on like getting that one thing and i feel like with youth like a lot of, i feel like a lot of people like like seeing youth you know, engaging in communities. So for the most part, like, you know, if you hit up some like, some like business owners, maybe they'll help you out. Or like, if you get in touch with some, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what kind of organizations could help with that, but like, just like doing research and kind of like focusing on like a, like one specific goal. Like, I feel like that could maybe do something. Thank you, Jessica. And Peretz, do you have anything? Yeah, just talking to your politicians and making sure that they're doing what serves the um, city wants and needs, you know, just like making sure that policies are implemented to protect us, you know, and our, what we need um, to have community gardens to get those um, workshops that I think Amanda just said. Um, so yeah, so we can work and we can get these things that we need as a community. Yeah. Um, I would also like to share that some things that can't, I was part of group three, so everyone knows, um, part, part of the thing, some of the things we discussed uh, was uh, talking about how climate change is going to, to affect um, our communities in the future and how we need to kind of learn um, uh, set ourselves up mentally for for this shift in um, in what our communities are going to look like. So uh, as we um, we should consider the fact that we will be opening up to um, 
climate refugees, people who are moving out of uh, regions that are impacted by wildfires, um, by just uh, by the things that we don't see every day, but but will be coming up in the future. Um, we also talked about uh, diversity and representation. Um, so a lot of these uh, environmental groups are unfortunately traditionally led by uh, white white folks, white men. <laughs> um, so uh, just opening that up and, and bringing more voices into the conversation, I think is super important. Um, so I'm just going to put that in here. Does anyone have anything else to add? Yeah, very quickly, uh, on behalf of Riverkeeper, count on us and your other green traditional green groups to uh, rebalance our resources so that we're working in more communities, not just the ones traditionally we've been working in, which is why we're so excited to be working in Kingston and North Troy and Ossining and Yonkers. Uh, so expect more from your green groups and uh, demand it. Demand it. I love that. I wanted to share a comment from group two as well, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, just something that I was really struck by that the water justice crew talked about was the lack of investment in the um, lower income portions of the community. And I just, I wanted to get this on the action item because this is something that I think needs to happen at a, at a broader scale and it goes maybe with the policymakers, um, but making sure that the investments in the community are there. Um, they talked about the potholes, the road construction, the pipes that break in certain neighborhoods and mysteriously not in other parts of the neighborhoods, the trash cans that may or may not be present that are impacting um, um, the community. So I think, and, and not to mention the parks and recreation areas that have been closed um, that don't, are, that um, recreation is, is so much harder. So I just, I wanted to make sure that that got, got on this list as well, because I think it was a really, really important comment that the, the youth fellows made. Thank you, Emily. Did I did I uh, did I articulate that? Okay, I was <laughs> trying to move. So ensuring that community investment is addressed, balancing resources across communities. Okay. I, I think I'm supposed to bring something up. Um, <clears throat> it is. Um, I just got to read it from the chat here. Um, oh, I'm wondering <clears throat> how Troy area youth and Indigenous and others can be engaged in meaningful dialogue and solutions for the forest in North Troy? Um, I'm sorry, was that a question directed at a certain, at a specific group? Are we talking to Water Justice Lab? Well, to people in Troy, um, and indigenous and youth in Troy and everyone else was in Troy because we're site specific. This is our backyard, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know that, that uh, I mean, with, with uh, you know, considering the fact that we are now at 301, we were trying to keep this more of a, a broad conversation, but if anyone wants to speak to that site specific issue, site, such a, such a, I see your hand going up here. Thank you. So one of the things that was brought up is, is these community gardens. And also we were talking about protecting uh, wooded lands that are on the Hudson. And this is this specific, specific site is an old growth, um, multi uh, faceted piece of property. It, it's one of the old, last accesses to the river. It's old growth forest and it's also a Mohican um, mine which is well registered and everything like that. And one of the proposals that we had for protecting this site and they're trying to turn it into hotels or whatever, one, or apartments. Uh, one of the proposals we had for this site was turning it into a community garden, a community, um, a partially a community garden with a, uh, teaching about agro food forestry, traditional um, practices in, in uh, and sustainability and foods, and then being able to protect the sacredness of the site and, and the fact that 
it is an access for the river that we don't really have in Troy anymore. And, and to destroy this for corporate interests um, is ridiculous. So one of the things that we were talking about uh, or that I'm listening about right now is that these youth want to kind of lead the charge in these kind of things. And what if we did protect this land and gave the youth a place to be able to put these things into practice and teach their local communities to be able to do these things as well. So um, one of the, we have uh, River Keeper here, we have, you know, representatives from Scenic Hudson that are looking into this situation. Um, you know, all of these amazing people in this room. And if we, if, if, uh, you know, we have youth that are willing to do this type of work in, in Troy, uh, and we'd be willing to stand, stand by and help teach about agroforestry practices and help to uh, get these, these kids going. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this group that would be too. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, being done by the Friends of the Mohicanatuck uh, group. And um, anyway, it's just something that I think that that is important, especially in Troy, when we don't have anything left uh, on the river, uh, as far as as far as access and forestry. I think that's was that good enough, uh, Sherry? Yes, thanks. Awesome, thanks for picking that up, Sage. I appreciate it. Um, so I think. We are we are past the time that we said we'd be ending today's uh, today's program. So if anyone has any last thoughts, um, otherwise I'm going to close it out. Anybody? Hands up. Um, no. Cool. Well, um, I really want to thank you all so much for being here uh, between last night and this afternoon. Um, I think there were really some beautiful, deep conversations um, that we had and some really intense issues that we addressed. Um, as Brenda dropped into the chat here, um, the conversation does not stop here. Like, let's stay in touch. Um, contact info at Media Sanctuary. I'm going to be sharing out this list of action items. Um, we can connect you all with Heather and Sachem. Um, you know, with their discussion, of course, um, and and with the youth groups, um, and uh, that's about it. Thank you so much to our youth groups for the incredible, incredible work that you are doing. Um, to our environmental mentors who really just like made this so beautiful and and just helped make it so much more of a. a, a deep experience um, and. Um, that's that's about all I have to say. You all keep up the really beautiful work, um, and please take time to self care and take care of each other and your communities. And um, at, as we continue this fight uh, for environmental justice, all across, uh, not just in the Hudson River watershed, but all over, um, this is a long fight. So um, if I did this last night, but I'm going to do it again. So if y'all want to unmute and give all of us a huge round of applause because this mm. has been so good. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Great job, okay. everyone.